It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! There is a kind of relish in seeing a story retold, you know, over the, over the years, and a new generation's perspective on it. There's something down here. And a new generation's take on what that would be like. Well, I'd say he's a size 17. Well, 360 pounds, eight and a half to nine feet tall. He has a bad gimp in his right leg. Yeah. You? No! Oh, no! oh my God! The Frankenstein monster! A monster? Who is the monster here? Oh, I have done nothing wrong, and yet you and your kind. So excellent. Come on, come on! Like this, and then one hand, no, then grab yeah. your face and sort of rip your face off and rip your body and rip it, rip it. Ah! We've seen so many times guys growing hair turning into wolves. I said, we can't do that. The growing hair thing, no matter which way you do it, stop motion or CG, it's just been done down. And so we came up with our own way. We thought, what if the man starts ripping his skin off and ripping his face right off? And the way they pitched it was fascinating, the way in which this creature apparently comes from within, which was, and I knew exactly, I thought, oh, great, with that I can run, I can run and fly with that. Action! Will Kemp came in, it's when we were casting in London, and he came in kind of off the street, and he just blew us away, he was like, his performance was great, and on top of that, when we asked him to turn into a werewolf, he was contorting all over the place. Action! No, no, wait, I only have a moment. But don't, 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 it wasn't until later we found out that he's a ballet dancer. He's done Swan Lake. He's done. I'm like, oh, that makes sense now. His body will do all these extraordinary things, you know, and, and very much uses it in his acting. And he's a sweetheart. Whenever you try to reinvent something so well known, you always try to, at the same time, give it justice and learn as much as you can about when it was created and why. Anna. But, you know, I only do half this part and the rest of it. We had to develop a lot of ways of tearing the skin and tools to make that work. You know, it's very tricky stuff because, you know, it has to look like um, the skin is pressing against the fur and then when you take off the skin, the fur pops out and so on. It's some R&D of ripping up cloth material, trying to figure out how do we determine where it splits, do we simulate that, do we define it? You know, we've got to have some flexibility because we know once we're into the shot, Stephen's going to want to split in different areas. And he's going to transform in different phases. His face may start transforming first in terms of shape and then his hands are going to rip out. And, you know, so we have to have that flexibility built in. That's the well. It looks amazing. The artwork's just phenomenal. So they show you any of the wolf stuff or anything? Nothing else? yet. We just arrived. Oh, OK. So. We're going to head over to the art department next. OK. Oh, okay. They've got tons of concepts. They've got tons of concepts. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. We actually have been building you in CG, both as right. a digital double and <laughs> a werewolf. Okay. So, yeah, wow. So. And a lot of this was, was done for, for your character. We go through a lot of reiterations for, for one creature, so this is just... Yeah, this is a small sample of all the research that we did. We love to look at nature. It always has to come back and kind of be real. And even though it's a very much a fantasy creature, a werewolf, it still has to be grounded. So we had a cast of a real wolf skull in, and we were checking how do the teeth bite and how do they overlap and really getting into that anatomy. When they ask you to design a werewolf, it's like, uh, well, yeah, exactly, what do you do? It's like redesigning water. All the models are based on this guy. This is kind of like the, uh, the Bible wolf guy. So in model meaning the digital model of the werewolf, this is the base for all of them. We built all the other wolves. That's why you see the, how the design buried here up on the wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we used the information that was the digital uh, grab from this, say this guy was scanned in. Uh -huh. We used the information, and that's why it modified this to come to this guy. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. we had to make sure that we could use all the information for all of them. I got you. 
Steven Summers kept on asking us to make the legs stronger, which was kind of feral looking and skinny and wild looking. I took pieces from that and then created the three per the personality of the actor and the characters that they were playing. When we build a clay maquette, we want to build something that we can scan into the computer. It kind of saves a lot of time down the road in, in the computer graphics pipeline. The scan really gets a lot of the proportions and all that stuff right, not necessarily all the details. Here we're just really just trying to get a feel for how this character is going to act, how he's going to run around. He is human, but he wants to be resembling a wolf, and so we're combining the uh, kinesthetics, if you like, of those two challenges. We had real wolves come in, which was fantastic, beautiful animals. We composited their real fur onto the top of the creature we were building uh, for a guide splines of not only length, but also properties of hair. Here you can actually see artwork, just the computer hair splines we're laying in that will be his hair eventually. And here you can see the actual CG sculpture on top of that. Here we just did a simple expression test just to make sure that the splines are tracking and behaving correctly on the face. Basically, we're changing the surface that we've created shapes on, so that was quite a challenge, meaning that as a surface is transforming, it's also tearing, and with the simulation and dynamics of it tearing and shredding, it's being changed by metaphysical effects that we can't plan or time, so we had to make a, a system that would work irrelevant of whether it was torn in half or torn in 10 pieces or 20 pieces. And certainly with the wolf, you covered them with fur, some areas. We had subsurface scattering to give a sort of more organic look to the hell beast creature. We had to transform Hugh Jackman into a big, scary werewolf, but also elaborate hair and so on. So it was a big challenge because it really required the best of the rest of the set. But we also then had to transform our hero and our villain. Finally, when Hugh transformed, I always wanted a really iconic image of the werewolf holding his love. I think that there are people that will see this movie that think the visual effects are phenomenal, like the most unbelievable visual effects they've ever seen. I'm one of those people. I can see everyday life all the time. For some reason, my sensibilities, especially as a writer, I guess. As a writer, I love to create stuff that you haven't seen before. Right, we're standing in Dracula's foyer. The entrance hall to his castle, which is obviously an integral part of the movie. He's built several interiors of his castle. We've got the antidote room, we've got the co Dracula's coffin room, we've got Dracula's laboratory, we've got one of the rooftops where some of the action takes place. So all, all in all, we've got eight or nine parts of Dracula's castle. And this is the biggest one, which is why we're outside, because it wouldn't fit on any of the stages. Here's Castle Dracula. At the end of the third act, our heroes, I don't know if you can see the little teeny guys right down there. This is how big this is. Summer sizing, it's, it's great. Even though the set is gigantic, it's not even close to being able to accommodate the size that the fortress actually is in the movie. So because of that, we're constantly shooting off this gigantic set onto a blue screen. And we see this and we think, oh my god, this is the biggest castle we've ever seen, and it should be. And then of course... Tipping crates are the, just to hold up the blue screen, which you see folded up on the ground there. And uh, rather than build the whole set, we can then repeat elements of the set on the blue screen and actually make the castle look many times bigger than the, the set that you see behind me. We built big sets. And so even though Steve is often shooting off the set, you know, onto a blue screen, we're just extending a big set that we already have. What you see here, we've, when you go back to the art department, you see sketches of the whole of what the, what the foyer would look like. So the columns you see behind me are 60 foot high, but in, in the movie they're 150 foot high. So obviously we've worked out perspectives and using perspectives and models what the overall look should be be as a guide for ILM and the mat artists. We had 60 men working for 16 weeks. That's almost from when the art department gave them the drawings. Then we obviously had a lot of sculptors sculpting the tour shares and the sculptures that you see behind me and the various elements on the door. This is uh, one of Dracula's tour shares. What would be 
pretty dramatic. When it's lit up, it looks really good, I think. But it's instead of frozen corpses of his victims, we've sort of made a tale that he actually turns them into volcanic basalt material. So it relates to the rest of the castle, really. Or painting, you know, artwork. And from that, we'll build this, which is a maquette. And this will give us the rough dimensions, so that way we're not building the actual model and then run into problems later. This way, quickly, we can see what the model's going to look like. And then we scale this up for the actual model. What a mo uh, an, an actual physical model or a miniature will give you that maybe CG won't is that you just get that real effect of light hitting a surface. Coming up with the design for this castle, we tried to stay as close to the artwork as possible. Um, there were certain areas that are called hero areas where the camera is going to be closer to the model. We've got our lab tower over here. Lots of uh, lots of story happens inside that guy. There's a big battle between Van Helsing Wolf and the Hell Beast, and it's where we have all of our our lightning strikes going and and zapping all of our pygmies into life. Right here, what we've done is added those tiny grain of wheat lamps. They're uh, to represent torches, which are about the size of a person's head, a six foot tall person's head. And from camera, this is fairly deep in the back corner of the model. But if you have that little point of light, it kind of helps you establish, oh, there's something back there, but it's really far away. What we can see from camera is the nice light that's cast on the back column and the area surrounding it. And throughout the model, we try and throw these little pools of light in to help you say, oh, there's some activity going on in that room. There's a fireplace in there, or uh, the uh, pygmy guys are, are roasting something to eat. The materials we used on this castle, the base is uh, polyurethane foam. It's a uh, it's almost like surfboard foam. It's a, you know, it's um, rigid. It's easily sculpted, and uh, we start off with that as the base. Sculpt into that a bunch of the cubby holes and the little windows and stuff. This uh, tower here is our antidote tower. The whole idea is that this tower is kind of the oldest of the bunch. Down here on the bottom, you get the sense that it's, it's been carved right out of the rock, kind of a Cappadocia quality. And uh, as they got higher, they had to build some, but you really get the, the idea that it's, it's the most weathered, and it's even a di kind of a different architectural style than the rest of our towers, kind of rounded and a little more weathered. In the back here is our big castle tower. It's basically just our, our big tower. We don't have much uh, in a way of a story to go there. It's just a nice backdrop for a lot of the shots on, that take place on the bridge um, in front of it. This, the, the bridge that connects these two towers, our antidote tower and lab tower, um, was designed from, uh, from blueprints from a, a full-size set that they used in LA. This is actually the bridge, part of the bridge that links the movie. It doesn't exist in reality. It's a little differently in, in, into the sequence of shots. And if that doesn't seem to be working, we have take two. Well, we build a second windmill, bring it up here, try it again, and better work that. Some, yeah, 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 we try and get a sense from the production designer what he's thinking yes. about in no, terms of the space. Great. Like in the village sequence, it was great because we actually got the blueprints for the entire village that Alan was building, and we modeled the village in 3D, and it was pretty much exactly what, what they built. So we were able to help Stephen stage his action, basically. It actually began in pre-production with the animatics. Like for this sequence, we originally, Jennifer and I broke out the script. And based on the script, we, we pulled a certain number of shots. Say we thought there would be, I don't know, 50 shots. And then they hired uh, Rapin to do animatics, who hired a small team of animators. And we broke out the animatics and say there were 70 shots of animatics. The previs is just part of the process. You know, it's like no one's tied to it. A lot of things happen on the day that, you know, you, you can't get what you, what you planned. But with the previs, it gives the director a tool that he knows that if he at least gets this, it'll work. 
the previous works is a phenomenal blueprint for, for these sequences. And I think um, it is becoming more and more common to, quote unquote, stick with the previous as your blueprint. <gasps> very unique in that regard. Yeah, I told you that cow liked me. I want it to be as real and organic. This movie it had to be, you had to absolutely believe that everything's real. And so it couldn't be about flying a camera around a little miniature model set. I wanted to build a village and fly a camera around the village. And that became quite a task. We thought it was very important to have their point of view. So since they fly, the camera also has to fly. He said, and it was fantastic to shoot there. And they built the biggest rig that's ever been built, a wire rig. It was this, the length of two football fields long and the width of the football field. And wires, maybe 15 wires stretching this entire thing. So they could hook the camera up, shoot it along. The camera could go. Action! The cable cam is driven by motion control software. It's driven by Cooper. So we can get the X, Y, and Z coordinates from it. The head itself is a simple hot head. But luckily, we've been shooting for weeks and weeks in the village. So the match movers have pretty much measured everything. So at this point, I don't think it's going to be a really. Alan Davio, our cinematographer, has been very particular about the amount of smoke that he puts in here. And, it, and I think it gives a very nice realism within sort of a hyper-real environment, which is exactly what we're looking for in the design of the movie. There's a cemetery in this a village set in the back, and, and we were shooting in that cemetery with our own snowfall, our effects people producing the snowfall. And it's a wonderful scene. It's one of my favorite in the film. And he's trying to kill him. He's a werewolf. He's going to kill people. He can't help it. It's not his fault. I know, but he'll do it anyway. Do you understand forgiveness? Yes, I ask for it often. Cut! Print it. Good, good. We said cut, we're going to turn around and move around, and they shut off the snow. <laughs> the snow was still falling, but it was real snow. And uh, it's just the nature of uh, being someplace and adapting. At least we're in, synchron in synchronization with the weather there. It's amazing, except the ground, of course, being a peasant village, is dirt. There's no pavement, there's no cobblestones or anything. And uh, they'd laid a bit of straw down, of course. The snow came, and then the rain came. And by the time we were shooting with about a 1,000 extras there all day, it was mud yeah, wherever you went. So it was kind of fun. I think the, the Czech people quite enjoyed seeing all these LA people with their Prada snow boots on, you know, trudging through the mud, you know. Oh. oh. <laughs> It starts off as Dracula's coffin room with a very ornate coffin in the middle of the room, and there's a whole sequence is played out in there. bringing a lot to the overall scope of things. I don't set out kind of a clear plan about all that. I kind of work my way through and go, hmm need something here, then you find what you need, and then when you find that moment again, you go, found that already, and that's kind of how it organically builds, rather than kind of getting too analytical about it. I wouldn't redo it for that, you know? Okay. Yeah, and I think, yeah, and Dennis can help that. I have to say that there's never been a better fit than, than Alan, because from day one, from the first cue, uh, the first time the first cue comes up, you just go, okay, well, here's another home run. 
Alan has goodbye vacation <laughs> between Christmas and New Year's. And I started literally seven days a week since January 2nd. And here we are about to go into April and I'm still chasing the movie. That, that one works on the set, then, on the set. then we want to wind up. Now we get the tritone, which might be all right. That's cool. No, that's cool. Okay. We're in. Oh, great deal. Good. He's We're cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Let's rock on. Go, go, go! Come on! Good. Subscribe to Monster Magazine when I was a kid. And I loved all of those great Dracula, Wolfman, Frankenstein films. So this has been a real blast to kind of have, have a whack at it. I want it to be the most amazing masquerade ball, and I thought it has to be really twisted, because basically it's, if Dracula threw a masquerade ball, what would it be like? And so I thought it has to be really twisted and weird, and we have to have everything there, flamethrowers and jugglers and high wire acts and tightrope walkers, and, and I wrote a veritable Cirque du Soleil. Remember Steve talking to me over the phone, he said, I've got an idea for, for the ballroom scene. I, I wanted to have a kind of feel of Cirque du Soleil, and I thought, oh, I'd just been to see O in Vegas. And I was like, oh, Steve, that's brilliant. <laughs> so the next draft for the script, I get, it is Cirque du Soleil, basically. Vodka, you're going to start out here. Come. Such a nice and you're going, we're going to find a way for you to go right through. We have two artists that were formerly with Cirque du Soleil on different shows. Both of them, Patrice Wojciechowski and Laurence Racine, were in Nouvelle Experience. And we have a variety of contortion and more classic juggling acts. Where's the lines? Dancers, linea, don't see. We found Deborah Brown, who, who basically choreographed all the Cirque du Soleil's. And we got her to come into Prague and figure it out for us. And it was great. She did a great job. It just like, she brought it to life. The first day I walked into the dancers' audition and saw 100 dancers practicing, I was overwhelmed. You are all dead aristocrats. <laughs> okay, you've been invited to Dracula's costume ball. No, so I need to know that you can be aristocrats in your yes. style. Yes. They're used to wearing, you know, beautiful things. Ladies, you never put your hands here. You never put your arms here. Arms must always have space. Very pretentious. <laughs> hired almost every single dancer we saw, 100, and I can't tell you what a great city to do a ballroom scene in because we have found 100 fantastic dancers. Also, we found 17 local circus artists. It's a big scene and you have to make sure that you take everything into consideration. But I, I actually enjoy working with large groups and numbers. It's, it's exciting to see it all take shape. Look at the ears. Slowly bring it up. I need your eyes slowly, like this.
actually two different uh, waltz rhythms that we have. The opening, which is a, a typical Viennese waltz. One a lot slower, Dracula's dance where Dracula actually dances with Anna. Steve described it very, very well. And the choreographer also spoke to me about where she was headed with it. But I think he really wanted to give himself, and in, in particular the choreographer, a chance to get a sense of where the musical thought here might be heading. And so we had to do it very early on. I got the guys to go for this concept of a solo soprano. So there's this very exotic, beautiful woman in the scene who's just thing you heard was literally maybe six or seven tracks on a synthesizer. And playback. But that was just a guide track. It's going to be very different when we do it with our 115-piece orchestra and our soprano soloist and our choir. It's nice to have that to work to, just for a sense of, of where this is going, rather than just clicks. Actually, I danced a lot as a child and was extremely unathletic in any other way. And then having gone through you know, that whole training, I turned up and couldn't dance to save my life. And Richard Roxburgh and I were just appalling, I mean appalling, disgraceful in the rehearsals. Plus, which he just has a very funny face and I was laughing mainly throughout the whole thing. Everyone? Where would you like to see it from? Should we do the top? Should we go from the very top? Go from the very top? Right when we come through the doors in your, the, the first song, the first uh, okay. number. As we come through the door and come up, we'll see what will come below. See all the jugglers, the jugglers and acrobats we're putting in. Okay. When we start to tilt up, we'll see the contortionist. We'll place her just right. As we come, start to come up, the stilt walker should be coming oh, through okay. the room towards us. I'll put the ball in front of them then. Wherever first of all, I think how difficult this is going to be to shoot. I never think about, oh, isn't this great that I wrote it and now it's going to be out, hit the celluloid now. I'm basically thinking, how the hell am I going to shoot all this stuff? Okay, so let's do one, uh, let's just look at it from the beginning. Okay, so everyone, this is Stephen Summers, the Hi. director. Hi, everyone. All Hi. 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 <laughs> this is our ballroom gang. Okay. All right. It's all, Deborah. it's all lumped. It's all a big lump. Okay. We rehearsed it in a very tight formation. Dancers, they have to be aware of this going to come between. They have to open. They're not aware. But obviously the camera needs, they need people in certain places, so the dancers have had to be very flexible. <laughs> so you have to tell the dancers, be careful because Vota will pass in front of you. Where, so they just have to be careful and go a little bit slower. Okay. The key is always to, you know, try to take the film into the world that the story is about. Going to Eastern Europe, to Prague, which you know, 150 years ago when a story took place, it would have been Transylvania. You can't build St. Nicholas's Church, you can't pay for that sort of set. It really does make the, the film so, so distinctive and extremely special. If you duplicated this kind of set, it just wouldn't look real. You, no one would believe you. This is probably the most extraordinary building in Prague. Everything you can see on camera that is on the walls is it. I mean, we weren't allowed to add anything, not that we'd want to. Just the candles and the, and the people and the orchestra and, and the nice lunch behind me. That's about it. How long did it take you to build this set, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> to build this set? About 700 years. <laughs> Everybody marked. Here we go. And playback. Ready, and door. Really proud.
proud of what we did there. It was, it was really remarkable. In fact, when you say the Masquerade Ball, which part? There's so many different things that happen in that, and it's, it's an enormous scene, and I, I'm trying to remember the number of days we filmed, but I'm still astounded by what was accomplished in there. Good, except for my arm. It's beautiful and it's gigantic and it's everything that we had hoped for for the sequence. There were many, many restrictions that were placed on us in using the location. It was a deconsecrated church, nevertheless. We had to be massively careful of upsetting anybody or moving anything because the re religious artifacts, of course, are still dotted about. A lot of the religious stuff is being covered up, the fact that there are altars and so on, yep. with drapes. And uh, yep. it's the restrictions on us as to what we can you know, rig to, which is very little, evidently. Yes. Are we doing anything with this paint color in here? Will this be darker? Hmm? Let us paint it. Won't let us paint it. Not as far as I know. We'll right, better keep the light off of it. <laughs> are we talking we about hang, hang, we're hang, hang drapes. hanging drapes? Hanging drapes. Okay. All the will hang drapes. If there was a bishop holding a crozier, we had to wrap gold around his hat to make him look maybe slightly like an Indian prince, something like that. So we used lots of plastic and we used lots of shields and we used lots of drapes and all sorts of oddments to you know, try an art department, including taking out the pews, of course, to turn it into a dance floor. All the candelabras we had made ourselves and uh, the prop department came up with, uh, with these candles and it's one of those filmic things. You, the last thing you want to be doing is saying, oh, hold on, we've got to go and light 150 candles. Can you hold the film? <laughs> well, you know, you can't. We never want them waiting for us. We want to be ahead of the game at all times. It looks fabulous when all the candles are lit. It really does, it looks, it looks superb. And, and of course, it's also sensitive to, uh, to where we are, so it's ideal. I don't know how the chemistry all came together. They got all excited about the script or the project or you know, working together, but to have you know, the production designer, Alan Cameron, and the cinematographer, Alan Davio, and the costume designer, Gabriella Pascucci, all three of them like at the top of their game. Just, I don't know, they magically all came together and just got it, and I've, I think they've done their best work. Because here's the thing. If I'm shooting this way, and even back, I probably won't notice the two tables. Or if we do, we just move them back. Yeah, like, this yeah. could be somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Steve is so enthusiastic and creative about it all that you sort of ratchet yourself up to, to try and get up to that level of energy, which is, which is a great process. And I'm just going to ask you, yeah. in a sense, is that a good thing for you? Because then you don't have to. Well, the only thing is the table up there is it's gloriously backlit, and it's uh, you've got a lot of nice things there. But I understand what you're saying. You want to be able to shoot, you know, or right. be your reverse. So as you know, you have individual moments that you, you do really appreciate for themselves. But mostly, when you go into a situation like that, it's pulling off the whole thing of making it a real place and putting people in there and letting their imaginations go wild. I think that is the real achievement for a cinematographer and, 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 and pointing at one individual thing or another. Usually it's not it. In the end, what you really appreciate is it's all part of the magic. You don't have to rub it in, but yes, Van Helsing does have a marvelous costume. And I get stuck with a jester's outfit. Mm. This movie is interesting because uh, I start uh, that uh, from uh, the period. But uh, I have the, the possibility to, to go with the fantasy. I can fly uh, with the fantasy. That is important for me. There is a lot extra. And uh, everybody is uh, black, uh, dark, uh, gold. And uh, Steve wanted that uh, Anna was uh, the surprise for help us, the color in this uh, case. We just thought it would be great to make her stand out because Dracula's basically made her bell of the ball there. And I would let you trade me. I have no intention of trading you. If I know Van Helsing, which I do, he's not planning on making a trade either.
I'm a cold, heartless bitch. Oh, the turtle is going back into its shell. Oh, Jesus. Way to go, shoulder. Way to go, shoulder. Way to go. This house is clean. Okay, I'll be in here. I'll get cable. <laughs> See Mark. Picture up. Ready and action. Oh my God. The Frankenstein monster. Come and get it, Frank. See if we can get more pictures. Oh, you son of a. <laughs> 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 Sorry, man. <laughs> what are you looking at? Together. <laughs> you. You. Wimp. Uh -uh. You don't want this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, flies. There's flies. <laughs> I give you Van Halen! <laughs> May others be as passionate in the hunting of you. Mm. Broke. <laughs> it's a low budget movie. I'm sorry. Beat me. Action! Where are we going? Through that window! Oh! Very good. Now, oh, jeez, you frightened me all out of me. I wasn't ready for that. Any part of me like to catch fire just at this no, point, I'm including coattails or no, hair. No, good. good. It won't happen if. So why did they attack in daylight? Clearly, they wanted to catch me. <laughs> it won't happen again. Oh, it's right. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Friggin' line. Right. What's the line? I'm a cold, heartless bitch. Can somebody give me a script? Because I'm, I'm sure those aren't the line. <laughs> hey, Daddy! I'm home! <laughs> Hang on. I know what lies in your last heart. Your father didn't have this or that. <laughs> you got another one of these? <laughs> He didn't have this cheap souvenir. Oh. 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 <laughs> Is that your sword or mine, darling? <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. See you later. Oh, are you in trouble? <laughs> Someday when I do a big budget movie, it, we won't have problems like this. My life, my job, is to vanquish evil. I can sense evil. This... <laughs> what? 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 See that? That was acting. It was me acting. That's why I stay back here. It's a flesh wound. Flesh wound. Hey, I know you. 
and neither you nor I will be able to stop my phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be in here. I've got cable. Cigarette, cigarette. <laughs> We're rolling! Are those who go through the front door? You know, those who speak their lines a little bit better than us. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would never trip. Oh. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. Here she comes. Yes, that's where I'm going. We people of the mountains believe at the castle there are vampires. Dracula and his wives, they take the form of wolves and bats. They leave their coffins at night and they feed on the blood of the living. One of Stoker's sources was an article entitled Transylvanian Superstitions. <laughs> Romania has somehow gotten this stigma, if you wish, uh, simply because Bram Stoker happened to see that article. Transylvania is connected automatically with vampires. Three, two, one, go. So I have, I'm stuck at 24 for the rest of my life somewhere. <laughs> Makeup is like one hour, and the special effects is like one hour and a half, so it's not too much. We have to wear prosthetics on our face in order to cover our eyebrows, because when we transform into horrible creature, we have no eyebrows, and it looks weird. <laughs> we enjoy ourselves doing the vampire things and flying and uh, being so jealous and with the nails and the fangs and these long wigs and it's great. <laughs> this is really cool to have character makeup, you know, instead of just pretty makeup. It's like you're, you're a vampire. It's really cool. Action! It took a long time to put all of us together, but eventually, he made the perfect cast. If I'd thought it was going to be tricky, I would have probably panicked. It was when the day was over, I was like, oh, God, I'm glad that went okay. That could have been a disaster. Find <laughs> Burkhan's gun! It has to be the silver bullets! Ah, Ooh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. <laughs> 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 